Yeah, so um, just with the outdoor revival thing, um, I'm actually like a fourth generation of outdoor revivals, Azusa Street Revivals. Um, if you don't know the history, in about 1906 is when it started in Los Angeles. It was a great move of God for all of America, all of North America, really. Um, it was where the Holy Spirit really fell upon a whole mass amount of people where um, things that hadn't been maybe seen in the, quite a while were suddenly being seen. Things that were very obviously reported in the Bible that, um, that hadn't maybe been actively uh, happening were happening. People were speaking in tongues. There was healings. There was deliverances. And the power of God really strong. And people that were a part of this revival sp brought it to all of North America. And uh, one minister came up, it was in Canada, I think maybe Ontario, and my grandpa, uh, this pastor kind of took him under his wing, said, you, you got to be saved from your life of sin. And so my grandpa was baptized and born again and received the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so then my dad, like at a young age, like five years old, received this, uh, which is very unique. And so it's a generational thing, receiving the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is for, in Acts 2.38, it says, for your children's children and to those who are far off and near. So I come from a Romanian background and that was for my family too. It's for not only the Jew but the Gentile and for all peoples. And so uh, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit is, is key. Uh, in the series I've been teaching, I've been teaching a series on fishing for people and a lot of times, like for the basically the first maybe 20 years of me believing in Jesus since I was a really young kid, I was different than my dad where he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit from like the age of five. For me, I started to believe in Jesus when I was three and I believed the Holy Spirit came in me. But there was something totally different that happened when I was 24, about 20 years later, where the Holy Spirit came upon me and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to be teaching that tonight. A difference between, and it's all in Scripture, the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit in you versus the Holy Spirit upon you in power. So I'm going to identify the difference between these because a lot of people, they'll say, what do you mean I have the Holy Spirit? So, but to see the difference between the Holy Spirit in you and upon you is key. And it's all throughout Scripture. So I'm just going to highlight that today. And uh, we desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. Otherwise, every work we do is almost in vain or it's going to be very little fruit to it. So I never reached a person for Christ, baptized anyone, saw someone born again when I wasn't baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it was like a night and day difference when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I, I told about that in the teaching last week, but it was basically just getting to a real point of desperation and surrender to God that I'd never been to before. And I started meeting people. Maybe Can you get the, wa the water? I'm going to use that as an imagery here. Uh, it's like some cups and stuff. Um, I started meeting guys who I didn't know that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I knew there was something different about them. They had something I didn't have. I didn't know what it was, but I asked God. I said, God, I want to love you the way they do, and whatever they have, I want to have. So um, this used to be me. Let's just say this is a person, okay? And I had the Holy Spirit, but just in a small amount or just barely, and uh, kind of just stagnant water, to be honest, because I wasn't r pouring out to others. If we're not pouring out to others, God's not really pouring in, okay? That when I said about like Friday, when I felt waves of the Holy Spirit come over me, okay? That most often happens when I'm really stepping out in faith into something kind of uh, where it, t it takes a big risk. And that's where God really steps in to pour out. When you, when you pour out, He pours in. And so, uh, but if I were just to sit at home all the time and just play video games, I'm not, I'm just going to be a stagnant uh, believer like this and maybe even losing uh, the Holy Spirit anointing in my life. And so I, I had, at the age of 24, barely any Holy Spirit in me, uh, but then I got baptized with the Holy Spirit and a transformation. And so, um, last week I taught on a road. I outlined the two roads. So there's a broad path to hell. Jesus says many are on this broad road that leads to destruction and hell and many enter through it. Many are on this path. But then I also identified that there's a journey towards Christ and Christ said, I am the gate. And he said, enter through the small gate and the narrow road, which leads to life and many people find it. 
And so there's a journey once we come to Christ, okay? We come to Christ here. And this is being born again to believe Jesus died and rose from the dead. And what should happen here as well is a, a water baptism to bury the old man. So this should be, this is, this often uh, isn't happen. There's not a healthy born again uh, experience for a lot of people, okay? So what should happen here is the person should truly repent of their sins. They should come to believe Jesus. Okay, they should be baptized to bury their old man. And they should receive the power of the Holy Spirit or Holy Spirit baptism. In Hebrews 6, it talks about the baptism. So there's more than one Holy Spirit baptism. And this is what I didn't receive for a lot of my Christian walk and wondered why I was powerless. Okay, so this is key in a healthy born again experience is these four components. And I also didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I didn't have true repentance is that I wasn't fully surrendered to Jesus. My whole life wasn't about him. He was a 5% sideshow in my life. So you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to teach on tonight. It comes out of a deep place of surrender, a deep place of realizing that on your own efforts and strengths, your life is just kind of mundane and pointless. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, you are, live an adventure for Jesus and see his glory and kingdom and miracles and lives transformed. But... Um, Anyways, so from that point, then there should be a whole journey of kingdom growth and faith growth and obedience. And like I said, there's ups and downs in this journey. It's not all peachy. There's persecutions, oppositions, trials. But overall, there should be an upward projection, okay? Now, people that don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, i just be honest with you because this is who I was. This is what their life looks like with Christ is a flat line. Okay, they're just kind of always in the same place, always the same faith, um, not really much growth. And uh, that's, I'm, and I'm not saying that they're not saved necessarily, but there's just no growth. And, and, and it's a, a path of, that just leads to emptiness. So I lived, lived in emptiness when I didn't have the Holy Spirit baptism. And um, so I believe I had the Holy Spirit in me, though. Maybe it was just a little tiny bit or whatever, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like a, a filling and a dwelling, um, a Holy Spirit upon you in power. So that's what I want to teach on tonight. And uh, this is where we want to be, guys. And this is, this is multiplying. This is bearing fruit, okay? When Jesus said to bear fruit, he said, go and bear fruit and fruit that will last. And so the fruit for me, it's the, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, so the character of God, but then also uh, multiplying yourself and bearing lots of fruit is bringing many belie other people to Christ. And so that's ideally what we want to see is fruit of the Spirit and, uh, and uh, multiplication. So I'm going to erase this just to show you where we left off. And um, I got to hit up the point here that without the water baptism... This is often a blockage in people receiving the Holy Spirit baptism. So, um, yeah, I'll have it where people from a Catholic background or different religious backgrounds that stemmed out of Catholicism, uh, some of them didn't cut off from all of the Catholic teachings that were false and not in the Bible. So one of them, for example, is being sprinkled with water, sprinkling babies as water with uh, water or adults even as water um, is not a baptism, okay? And uh, I call people to get baptized and they say, oh, I, I already like my parents sprinkled me with water. I said, what is that? That doesn't have to do with anything of being baptized. Uh, so baptism is a burial of the old man and to it says in the word to repent and be baptized and you will receive the Holy Spirit. So sometimes that blockage is not repentance. That was my problem. Not true repentance. Some people it said they need to get baptized. I've seen people from really traditional backgrounds who realize they need to get baptized. And then they receive the holy, power of the Holy Spirit really strong when they get baptized and bury that old person. And so you'll see a life transformation and huge growth. Uh, people that haven't been water baptized, sometimes they read the Bible and it's like it doesn't come alive to them. It's just like they feel like they're uh, just reading words that are dead and it's not doing anything for them. And their faith never grows. And they're like, I don't know what to do, how to grow. And I'm like, well... You need to get baptized, like what the Word says, believe and be baptized, and you will be saved. And 
So a baby can't believe, a baby doesn't have sins to repent of. And so um, Jesus even himself was dedicated in the temple as a baby, but, uh, and he was completely pure and never did a sin, and he still got baptized at the age of 30. And that's when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him. So you want to be like Jesus, or do you want to uh, hold on to your parents' faith? And so be like Jesus. All right, so I'm going to just erase this to get into the difference between the Holy Spirit in you and upon you. There's actually three different positions of the Holy Spirit. There's one where the Holy Spirit's with you. So in uh, John 14, it says right now the Holy Spirit is with you, but he will be in you. Okay, so with you, the Holy Spirit, even with an, is, I think, with an unbeliever to some extent. So an unbeliever will sometimes still feel conviction. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is somewhat there with them, trying to draw them to the Father, uh, but not yet in them. Okay, so I'm not going to focus on the with you part, uh, but we're going to just focus on in you and upon you. Okay, so the Holy Spirit in and upon. Okay, and usually with the Holy Spirit coming in, then you're going to see the fruits of the Spirit start to grow. Okay, so you're going to see like love, joy, peace, patience. Yeah, was there a question? I just wanted to ask, this is this guy Matthew wants to ask, Matthew Morton. Um, are those fruits automatic when the Holy Spirit's there, or do they have to surrender and repent of carnality and flesh and sinfulness in order for the Holy Spirit, who's a gentleman, to then take over and produce those fruits? Yeah, so those fruits might not instantly develop, but everything, you, usually with Christ, is a process over time. Some of them might come instantly, but uh, yeah, it's a process. I'm still growing in the fruits of the Spirit. And yeah, it comes out of repentance and realizing that, oh, I don't, I'm not a very patient person. I'm not patient with my wife. And I need to develop self-control in terms of some of the, um, maybe my eating habits or uh, the things I'm focusing my eyes on. So yeah, uh, the fruits of the Spirit grow over time, okay? Now, uh, but the Holy Spirit upon is for the gifts of the Spirit, okay? The gifts of the Spirit start operating in a person. So I never walked in the gifts of the Spirit at all until I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this would be things like, so, so this is what's cool is that there's nine fruits of the Spirit in total. Okay, guess how many gifts of the Spirit there are listed in Corinthians uh, 12? Nine. There's nine, so it's a real cool matchup. But these would be things like healing, uh, faith, Anybody else want to shout one out? Uh, word of knowledge, word of yeah, miraculous word, miracles. Word of knowledge, miracles, prophecy, yeah. speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. So the whole list of those, okay? Now, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon, now this is what I see in scriptures, that this begins to be the access point to all of the gifts. So not that instantly you'll walk in all of the gifts, but you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then from that point, you can start to grow and operate in, I believe a believer can operate in all of the gifts. We're not limited to just one. You're going to have two or three that you're most strong in, but you can operate in all of them to some degree. And you can grow in certain ones in certain seasons. God has me growing in a certain season for healing and then a certain season for another gift and he slowly grows you over time as a need comes up especially then he'll grow you in that certain spot and so um this is a whole journey now this is like a, a football player okay you want to be a football player um imagine if you never put equipment on you okay if you never put equipment upon you is the referee or your coach going to let you on the field no so people that are not baptized in the holy spirit I don't see them, I'll just be honest with you, and this was myself too, they, I don't see them going out to preach the gospel, to win souls for Christ, and uh, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. I just don't see it happening, because they don't have the proper equipment upon them. Maybe they're not baptized in water yet, and in Galatians 3, it says that when you're baptized into Christ, you put on Christ, okay? That you were clothed in Christ. And then uh, with the Holy Spirit baptism, it's like being drenched or immersed or submerged in the Holy Spirit. So then now you have the equipment to get out on the football field. And then maybe you're a quarterback. So your strength is maybe throwing the football or uh, planning a strategy. So maybe you have two gifts you're strongest at. 
Does that mean that you can't kick the ball uh, into the football? Does that mean you can't kick the ball for, uh, what's it called when they do the one-point conversion? Does that mean a quarterback can't do the one-point conversion? No. So a quarterback can get on the front line of the defense or whatever if they had to. Okay, so we can walk in all these gifts once we receive the Spirit upon us in power. Now, a lot of people have been turned off to this stuff for various reasons, okay? Satan does not want people to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit upon them. He doesn't want us to receive this either, but he, he'll turn people off to this by playing up the extremes, okay? So you know a pendulum and how it swings to the extremes? Okay, so one extreme is... Um, the crazy charismaniac kind of stream where people are claiming things are the, that are the Holy Spirit that are not. Okay, so maybe somebody's, I don't know, crawling on the floor barking like a dog and saying it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, maybe they're saying things like, if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not saved and stuff like this that's not in the Bible, right? So these kinds of lies, extremes over here, and I've experienced that in the past. And so, but if you have a bit of discernment, you can pick it out and be like, yeah, that's not in the Bible, that's wacko. Okay, so don't let that stuff turn you off from the real thing, from the genuine thing. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay, so people will be, oh, I don't, uh, that speaking in tongues thing, that's not for today, that's not for me, because uh, 10 years ago, there was someone that did that gift inappropriately. So, well, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Now, this was in Corinthians 14. The church uh, was a little out of control, and Paul had to correct them. He had to say, hey, guys, like, with the speaking in tongues thing, like, maybe don't get up for half an hour just speaking in tongues, because it's not doing anything for anyone. Okay, so he corrected this uh, extreme. But there's another extreme. was more like the church in Ephesians. When Paul first showed up to them, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? And the people were like, we ain't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. So they ain't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And the people grow up in this kind of extreme here as well, where their church never talks about the Holy Spirit, or they've never heard about Him, or never heard even about the gifts of the Spirit. And that's just kind of hush-hush, swept under the rug. And so this is an extreme too that Satan loves. Okay? Now, we need to find the truth and, and, and right in the middle. Okay? So we need to grow in, in truth and love and uh, the gifts of the Spirit, and the love, and the fruits, and all at the same time. Don't try to play these extremes, okay? So, but this is something we need. And so let's open our hearts and minds, and let's get into the Word to see where this is in the Word, because otherwise it's just me, me ideas. And so, uh, we're going to get into where we see this in Scripture. Now, I'm going to guide us through kind of from the beginning into uh, the day of Pentecost and the early church, okay, with the, with the Holy Spirit. Where do we see the Holy Spirit throughout? Now, Holy Spirit, okay? Holy means set apart. So you want to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you got to get set apart, not want to fit in with the world, but want to fit in with God's ways. Mm -hmm. And Spirit means breath, okay? So Holy Spirit. And where do we see this in Scripture? Well, right from the beginning, when God creates Adam and Eve in Genesis uh, 1... Sorry, I'm going, to jump, I'm going to get into Genesis 2 when he creates Adam. And he says, uh, it says here in Genesis 2, verse 7, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And so right from the beginning, Adam and Eve, they received the Holy Spirit in them. Okay, they received, it says he breathed and they became spirit beings. They received the breath of life in them. Okay, now in Genesis 1, like verse 2, it also says that Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering, hovering over the waters. So over all of creation, the Holy Spirit was over all of creation. So the Holy Spirit was in them, but also upon them. Okay. And they were filled to the brim. So for me, I used to only have the Holy Spirit in me. And what woke me up to the re realization that I didn't, that either I was missing something, was believers that were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I started getting around them. Okay. And what happens is that this trickle, overflow of God from them starts to impact you and wake you up and realize you're missing something. So uh, anyways, but Adam and Eve were, had the, the full experience of God and the Holy Spirit in them and upon them and power, but we all know what ended up happening with their story. 
is that they chose to eat from the tree they weren't supposed to. They stepped into sin. And what happened at that point? They became spiritually dead. And actually, completely spiritually dead. Now they would die. Death entered the world and no longer did they have that direct communion with God. And they are completely empty. And uh, now throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we don't see um, examples of people getting the Holy Spirit in them. But what we do see is when a mighty or miraculous thing needs to happen, we see where people get the Holy Spirit upon them. So uh, you keep seeing this in and upon stuff. The Holy Spirit comes upon them whenever they need to walk in power. So you'll see this all throughout the Old Testament. Let's just look at the example of Samson. The Spirit of the Lord, this was a guy that walked in power, ripping lions apart. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart and with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. So there you see the upon in power to do some kind of mighty thing for God. So all throughout the Old Testament, you'll see where the Holy Spirit comes upon them in power. Okay, now I'm going to uh, move on really quick here through the, through the story of the Bible. But we see a huge, this was for like, uh, like two, a couple thousand years where people didn't have the uh, full uh, revelations of God and the Holy Spirit in and upon them until Jesus stepped on the scene. And what was unique about him, he was the first person to have what Adam and Eve had in the garden in terms of uh, when he was born, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. So everyone else was born with this sinful DNA, sinful nature, but Jesus wasn't born with it because uh, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, implanted in Mother Mary's womb. And is that, it's kind of like a surrogate mother, okay? So he had a different DNA. So it doesn't say, though, that Jesus was born with the Holy Spirit upon him, but with the Holy Spirit in him. So when he was young, he uh, grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor before men and God. So he definitely had the fruits of the Spirit on display in his life, as we see in scriptures. But um, there's no talk of him walking, having the Holy Spirit upon him at all until a significant point in his life, until the age of 30, when he got baptized, okay? And that's when the Holy Spirit came upon him in power. And that's when all of a sudden, a huge outpouring of miracles and signs and wonders and and all kinds of healings and casting out demons. And so um, this is what John says at Jesus' baptism. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. This goes back to what Matthew was saying with the dove that kept remaining on our house. And we saw that as a cool sign from God. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on on him. This is the first mention of the Holy Spirit on Jesus. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain. And this was what was interesting too. In the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon people, it was just for a quick, uh, like supernatural thing they had to do, but then the Holy Spirit would often lift off of them, just there for momentary times. But this was significant to say that the Holy Spirit remained upon Jesus. Okay, at his baptism, the, the man on, who you see the Holy Spirit come down on and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is very unique that it says that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Jesus will do this. Okay, this was big revelation. I've seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. So when Jesus got baptized, I wish that there was more water in here to show his baptism because he got immersed. And when you get immersed, that should, he should come up overflowing, okay? So I've literally had people who thought they were baptized, but weren't. Maybe it was the baby sprinkling thing, may, uh, all different th things that they could have received a, a false baptism. Uh, but when they receive the baptism, uh, they get baptized, bury their old man, and, and they'll often uh, then receive the power of the Holy Spirit if that was a blockage for them. And so uh, that's is the point when Jesus was baptized in the Spirit. Now, at a certain point, he starts to promise things to his believers, or to his disciples. Uh, so in John 14, he says something really significant. He says, 
Okay, but, but you know, the world cannot accept him, talking about the Holy Spirit, because it neither sees him nor knows him. This is John 14, 17. But you know him, for he lives with you. So this is, he'll, he lives with you. He wasn't in the disciples yet. But, and then Jesus says, but he will be in you. Okay, so this was a promise Jesus made. And when do we see that happen, that the Holy Spirit comes into the disciples? Um... We see that, so he dies and rises from the dead. And then, um, and then there's a point which Jesus interacts with the disciples before he raises up to heaven. And Jesus says to them in John 20, 22, and it says here, And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. When do we remember seeing breath in the Bible? It was right in that Genesis 2. There's a connection here where... Jesus breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone, they will be forgiven. If you do not forgive, they're not forgiven. So he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. So this is the first people, the disciples there, are the first people to G believe in Jesus' death and resurrection. And um, at that point of believing in death and resurrection, uh, it, with, with Scripture there, it seems to point towards the fact that the Holy Spirit came in them. Okay? Now, what's interesting, though, is that, um, yeah, they believed in Jesus, the Holy Spirit's in them, but Jesus said to them, um, don't go out and try to reach the world, go and wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. What? You said receive the Holy Spirit, now you're saying wait till you receive the Holy Spirit? So there was something they had to receive still, it was the dunamis power. Okay, so we see, and what's amazing is the day of Pentecost is coming up on Sunday, so we're jumping into that here. So um, this is interesting is that Peter was a guy that rejected Jesus three times, was ashamed of Jesus. And, uh, and, but then we see 50 days later where he preaches a message to people that easily could have put him to death. And 3,000 people, he goes from rejecting Jesus three times to 3,000 people coming to Christ and being baptized in one day. So what changed for Peter? Was it that he got Jordan Barr's amazing evangelism teaching on how to fish for people? No. Was it that he got, went to Bible college? No. It was that he obeyed Jesus and said, wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you in power. And then that happened where they received the Holy Spirit in power for the overflow. So Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem. This is in Acts 1, right at the beginning. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, wow. It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father set by his own authority, but you will receive power, dunamis power this refers to, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So this is significant, guys. Is What is the purpose of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit? Is it to get tingly feelings and feel all happy and giggity. Uh, some people say, oh, just, just about getting drunk in the spirit or something. I'm like, what? It's about becoming a witness is why, why you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so this is what they're waiting for. So they're in an upper room on the day of Pentecost. And I'm jumping in Acts 2. On the day of Pentecost, they're all together in one place and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Here we see the blowing of the wind again came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, filled to overflowing, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So people were uh, there for a festival from all different countries because there was a festival going on in Jerusalem and they were all understanding the tongues in their own home languages. And they were amazed. So Peter gets up and preaches a sermon in power and, and the people are convicted and cut to the heart that they're responsible for Jesus being put to death. And that's the same thing for me today. I'm responsible for Jesus being put to death. They say, what must we do to be saved? Now does Peter say, uh, just put up your hand and say yes to Jesus. I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable here. So just within your own heart, just say this little prayer. No. Peter says, repent, leave your old life and turn to God. So turn to God. Get baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. 
repent, baptism, receive the Holy Spirit. And so a lot of people would be like, well, maybe that's just for the 12 disciples, just for those ones that were really faithful. Okay, so was it just for them? Well, we see in Acts 5 that this Holy Spirit baptism becomes for more people. So um, Philip, an evangelist, he goes to Samaria and, and uh, to bring the gospel to the people there. And they respond to it. They come to faith, they get baptized in water. But then what's really interesting is that um, uh, Peter and John they come and visit and they lay hands on those believers and it's at that point that they, those believers receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They believed in Jesus, okay, probably had the Holy Spirit in them but not upon them. They weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is that there's a, a guy um, who, who sees this and, and he was a guy that practiced sorcery and he was like, I want to receive that power that I see that, they're, that they received. Um, how did he know that they had received something? He said, I saw what, I see what they received, okay? We don't know what they saw, but I'm guessing it's like many of the other examples in the book of Acts where the people spoke in tongues when they received the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so we're going to see more examples of that. Um, so, but you could say, ah, that's just for the Jews. That's just for the Jews is this baptism of the Holy Spirit thing. All right, so let's check out Acts 10 and what happens there is that Peter gets called, well, no, let's just, just check out Saul first, okay? Saul uh, came to faith, okay? But for three days, he didn't get baptized. And then Ananias lays hands on him, and that's when he receives the Holy Spirit. So for, this just shows that a believer cannot, uh, it's possible for a believer to not have the Holy Spirit upon them. Okay, now Acts 10, we see the, those dirty Gentiles, those dirty, dirty Gentiles. Would it really be possible, if being, the Holy Spirit's being set apart, those dirty Gentiles, no way that they could receive it. Um, so Peter goes and preaches to a group of Gentiles. God calls them out and he's like, I don't want to go to those dirty Gentiles, but God says no go. So he's preaching to the Gentiles and as he's preaching... This is social distancing, guys. This is like you got to be at least two meters away from the people. He's preaching to them from a distance, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit falls on them. It says the Holy Spirit falls on them. While Peter was still speaking, this is Acts 10, 44. While he's still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on those dirty Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So how did they know that the Gentiles were like, um, had, that they had received the, the gift of the Holy Spirit? How did they know? There was a sign, right? Instantly, it was that they spoke in tongues and praised God. Then Peter said, can anybody keep them from being baptized? So this is a really cool story that they actually received, oh, I erased it, but they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit before the water baptism. So, uh, just to let you know that there's not formulas with God, and when we make a formula, God likes to flip it on us. Uh, he's creative, Holy Spirit's creative, and so um, that they receive the, the, the water baptism after Holy Spirit baptism. And I've seen this happen where people, it's like they get baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then they come to repent, and then they believe in Jesus, and then they get baptized. Sometimes God just likes to flip the tables on us, because we make a bunch of religious rules. Um, so you could say, ah, oh, well, maybe it's just for people in the Israel area. Like, maybe this isn't for all people. So let's just check out one more example here is uh, when Paul goes to the Ephesians, okay? So this is far off from Israel. This is getting into the Europe area, or at least Turkey area. To, so Paul goes to the Ephesians and he says, when you came to believe, like um, there was an evangelist who went ahead, uh, was it Apollos? Yeah, Apollos went ahead and it says he taught the word of Jesus accurately. But Paul comes and he says, did you receive uh, the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? And this is the group that like, we ain't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. And so Paul said, he says, then what baptism did you receive? So they had not received the proper baptism. They weren't baptized into Jesus. Okay. So they get baptized into Jesus and then Paul lays hands on them. And then the Holy Spirit came on them. It says in Acts 19.5, then the Holy Spirit came on on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied there was about 12 of them in all so here we say see this thing where it's for for all of those who are far off and those who are near it's for all people this is for jamaicans this is for 
Australians, this is for the Dutch, this is for all people can receive this. And I've seen people who come from really traditional backgrounds that end up receiving these things and walking and speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues and healing and all of these gifts. And I've seen these uh, grow in my own life, but I never honestly thought God would want to use me for that kind of stuff. Like I thought that's just for some um, really supernatural person out there. But no, this is for the everyday average believer can receive these things. And what's interesting is that um, the book of the Pentecost example, they had to wait like 40, 50 days to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. But every other example after that, it's like an immediate thing so that you don't have to wait and tarry for 40, 50 days. Um, I just want to tell a qu quick example of a guy that received this recently. He just knew that this is something he's missing. He grew up, it's like a Presbyterian that he grew up in, but he just, he, he had started to see other examples of people that had the power of the Holy Spirit like this. And he said, I need this. So he came to me twice to be prayed for. He drove like 45 minutes from Coquitlam to be prayed for. And both times we didn't see any breakthroughs. And uh, it doesn't matter to me. I just keep being obedient and keep going faithful. But he didn't receive it. But then uh, he just called me the other day and he was so excited to tell me, Jordan, I received the power of the whole, I received this baptism of the Holy Spirit and I spoke in tongues. He's like, I got, I just kept going at it, getting different people to pray for me. And this lady prayed for me and, it, and I, it's, it's happened. And he was so excited. And uh, this is what really shows that it comes out of a point of desperation receiving this. It's not just, oh, I go play some video games for a couple hours this morning and then, oh, maybe I'll receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, it's like a desperate thing. And when out of desperation, God shows up. So he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for they will be filled. And I believe that's talking about the feeling of the Holy Spirit. So, um, to receive it, a hunger. And um, he just kept pressing in to, that he, want, he was desperate to receive this. And then God showed up. So that's what I, I see happen with people. Uh, maybe it's a cutting off of family traditions and religious traditions to receive the real things of Jesus. And then you re they receive power of the Holy Spirit. And I've had other people that receive this. Uh, a Catholic lady, she gets baptized, a couple demons leave her in the baptism, she immediately speaks in tongues, and then she's, she's like, ever since then, when I read the Bible, it's like everything connects, all, it, like all the stories connect, and God just comes alive to me when I read the Bible. I just love hearing stories like that. And so this is for all people, power of the Holy Spirit, and um, it steps in all through the rest of the Bible to the early church where Paul highlights all the gifts of spirit we can walk in now. No? Okay, now, pro the, what ends up happening is people have a lot of questions about speaking in tongues. Um, I'm just going to touch on that real quick, I think. Because there was a bunch of the stories about receiving the power of the Holy Spirit upon them where it talks about immediately they spoke in tongues. Now, like I said, when people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, now they have access to all the gifts. Out of all of these gifts, which ones do you think are the easiest to first display for God to first show? Okay, is healing something instantly that they could show? Probably not unless there's somebody there who's crippled or something that you'd go and pray for them. But the speaking in tongues is the one that's most easily, obviously showed. And sometimes they prophesied too. It wasn't just speaking in tongues that was the sign. Um, but for me, it's not about, it's not about uh, receiving the tongues. Okay, David Wilkerson does a really good teaching. Uh, this is not a shoe, but he says in receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's not about if this was a shoe with a tongue. He said, when you go to the store to buy shoes, you're not going to buy the tongue of the shoe, right? You're going to buy the full shoe. So uh, it's not about just receiving the tongues, but it's about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues is just a part of it. Okay, but it's often the, what people first to display or demonstrate because it's just one that's easy to show. But I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then it wasn't until about a year later, I was reading in Corinthians 14. Um, I just like really encountered and felt the power of the Holy Spirit on me. But it wasn't until a year later, I was reading Corinthians 14 about speaking in tongues. And I was like, oh, why don't I speak in tongues? If I have the power of the Holy Spirit, I should be doing that. And so uh, in, within an hour's time or something, I think I watched a teaching on it. And uh, he said, a lot of people, there's people out there who have received this but they've never stepped out in faith to activate the gifts. So once you receive the gift or the power of the Holy Spirit, then there's a whole journey of growing the gifts and walk, stepping out in them. So I just had to actually, I, I had already received the gift, which access to all the gifts. 
And I just had to step out in faith to start speaking out. So I had to actually start speaking out for the gift to operate out of me. So just like healing or anything, uh, it's like maybe even the gift of giving, okay? Some people walk around thinking for years, oh, God's just going to grow me in the gift of giving. Like my money's just going to jump out of my pocket and go give to people. Like, no, you want to grow in the gift of giving, you need to start giving to people. Mm -hmm. So with any of the gifts, you got to step out in faith, okay? Teaching on fishing for people, okay? And in fishing, you need a tackle box or like a box full of tools. So eventually God wants to grow you in each one of these one at a time. And when you're ministering to somebody, then maybe not every person needs healing, but somebody has a... God gives you a word of knowledge about when they were abused when they were seven years old and you just speak to them that Jesus was there and knows knows that and he wants to heal that. So you speak out a word of knowledge that because that's what the person needed. So uh, you develop a toolbox of how to converse with people, how to pray for somebody. You develop all of these gifts and it's like tools in your tool belt. Okay, but um, speaking in tongues is really important for growing in all the gifts because in Jude 23 it says... Uh, it says, uh, keep, or sorry, Jude, maybe 20 or 21 is, and build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the spirit. Okay. So it actually grows your faith to pray in tongues, to pray in the spirit. Um, but what is the purpose or point of speaking in tongues? Well, it's uh, basically, it's like God praying through you. Okay. I can pray with my mind, my own prayers and thoughts. But wouldn't it be amazing if God could pray through me? That would be like a pretty perfect prayer. So it says in Romans 8, like when we do not know what to pray, the Spirit prays through us through groans we do not understand. And so what I like to explain it to people, the speaking in tongues, it's like, um, you know, a Wi-Fi signal. It's like Kingdom of God Wi-Fi, okay? So this is me here maybe. And God's downloading, okay? When it says, I do not know what to pray, he prays through me, through prayers I do not understand. And then it also says, it's really interesting in Corinthians 14, is that um, when we pray in tongues, we do not uh, pray to men, but to God. So when we pray in the Spirit or pray in tongues, we're praying to God, okay? So he's praying through us and we're praying to God. So it's literally like you're like a, a hotspot, Wi-Fi hotspot for the kingdom of God. If you're going around speaking in tongues, it's like God's downloading from heaven and, and through you to earth and then uploading back to heaven. So what a powerful thing. That's got to be perfect prayers, hey, if you're praying in the spirit. So downloads and uploads, downloads and uploads. And so I pray in this. Paul says in uh, Ephesians 6, 18, he says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So to pray in the spirit, uh, why am I signifying that that means speaking in tongues? Uh, it might mean that you're doing like a groaning deep depths of prayer, but it's also definitely speaking in tongues because in Corinthians 14, um, Paul says that uh, when I pray in the uh, spirit, my mind is not active, but my spirit is. So, good. This is so, good, so it's the spirit praying through you. And so this is the power of it. And praying in the Spirit on all occasions. And what's interesting in Ephesians 6 is he's talking about putting on the full armor of God. And the capstone of the full armor of God is, you know, there's like this helmet of uh, salvation, the shield of faith, and all these things. But the capstone of your weaponry is in praying in the Spirit. Okay, so it's a weaponry against the enemy. Some people have said that the enemy doesn't, he understands your prayers in English, but not in tongues. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's what some people have said. Um, but yeah, so praying in tongues, it's God praying a perfect prayer through you. It grows you in faith. So I believe in praying in the spirit that you can grow in healing and you can grow in all of the gifts because it grows your faith. Okay, and praying in the spirit, it's also a part of the weaponry. Uh, there's many benefits to praying in the spirit. So I do it a lot. I'll be driving, driving at work for 20 minutes and I'll be praying in the spirit. Uh, praying in tongues is a powerful thing to grow in all the gifts. So that's why I highlight it. And, um, and that's why it's an important thing to step out in, to walk in, to grow in. And God develops a language out of you. So to, to uh, receive that gift, to receive the gift, we want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and um, oftentimes it'll start with speaking in tongues. It doesn't have to, I believe, but uh, it can, definitely should and can. 
And so there is a point where you have to step out in faith. A, a blockage, there's a, there's a blockage for people where they think that God's going to like come and control them almost. Like they're a robot. He's going to come and control their mouth. Like, no, God doesn't ever control us. One of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. So you're fully in control of it. I can speak in tongues and turn it off and sing and all kinds of, and then I can stop and then I can, you know, so it's something that you're fully in control of. But at the same time, it's like God work is praying through you at the same time because it's a relationship with God, right? It's not just me or just him. It's together. And I don't usually do it in public like this in front of a bunch of people. And I definitely don't do it for half an hour in front of people. But just to show them an example of what it is, that's why I do it right now. Like, because pe some people have never heard it before and they're already freaked out just hearing me speak in tongues. But it's, uh, and I was like, when I first started speaking in tongues, I was afraid to do it in front of everyone, anyone, like even my wife. I was like, uh, so was nervous about what she'd think about me and stuff. So eventually I did that in front of her, eventually with another person or two. And then it just becomes a part of your life. But yeah, I don't go uh trampling on people speaking in tongues at them and stuff it's just something more mostly in my private life so speaking in tongues has three different purposes okay so it is to edify yourself there's a verse i i gotta sharpen up on my memorizing of first corinthians 14 but there's a verse that says uh speaking in tongues is to edify yourself so it builds up your own faith so there's a private so if this is speak in tongues what is a rap that I did? I'm bilingual. I speak in English and I speak in tongues. I do it in private. You probably won't hear it. I pray in the spirit is kingdom come. So speaking in tongues has a private application and a public one. Okay. So there is a time and a place for it to be public. Um, so private is for me, for growing edification and then for public. Use. There's an example in Corinthians 14 where someone is instructed to speak in tongues in front of a group of believers, but then someone's always supposed to interpret it. So if there was someone here, they could interpret me speaking in tongues right now today. But it's like for uh, the church, okay, that's for the church and someone interprets it. And then another really cool public speaking in tongues is for the unbeliever or to reach the lost. And so this is like, uh, it's like an actual language, okay? So one of my buddies in, out in uh, Quebec, one time he was up in a reservation in uh, First Nations Reservation, Northern Quebec, and he just, this guy that wasn't really open to prayer, but he ended up letting uh, my buddy pray for him. And as he's praying for the guy, the guy says, whoa, stop. He says, who taught you that language? Or who taught you how to uh, speak my language? And the guy, he's like, I don't know, I just speak French. Uh, and, he's, and he's like, I'm just speaking in tongues. And the guy says, no, you're speaking my language. And the guy says, well, what am I saying? And, he, and the guy interprets for him what he's saying. And he says, you're telling me about the good news of Jesus. And so it's an amazing miracle. And so God still does that stuff today where he'll use the speaking in tongues to translate it to people for the gospel. So these are the purposes of speaking in tongues, but it's not about speaking in tongues. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. So sometimes I want to get into receiving that now. There's people watching that are going to receive this tonight. And I'm going to pray for you over video. And just like Cornelius' house received from a distance, you can receive from a distance tonight. Um, and in receiving, it's all about humility and deep places, surrender, repentance of your sins, really turning it all to Jesus and acknowledging that you need him and you need his power. Uh, I'm going to pray for you here. So Jesus said, I'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And he said, um, if you ask for, uh, if you ask for your father for a uh, uh, fish, he's not going to give you a snake. He says, if you then though you're evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more will the father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So some people just haven't even asked for this gift. And, just in, and you just need to ask and then step out in faith like you've received. And Jesus said, I will baptize you. So it's not me baptizing you, but Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. All right. So, and if you want to receive, this is a hand to receive. And so uh, let's just lay down our old life first. So Father, I repent of my sins. I'm done with doing things my own way, Lord. 
Lord, I've never really surrendered to you, given everything to you. I've never really laid down it all for you. I've never really sought you. I've never really pursued you. Lord, I, I repent and I turn from my own ways. I, I repent and turn. And uh, I just put my hands up, uh, flip them over now to receive. And Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come right now with your power. Holy Spirit, come in me, come upon me in power. Holy Spirit, come right now. Jesus, baptize me with your Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. I speak freedom over everyone in Jesus' name. Freedom over everyone in Jesus' name. Freedom from fear. All fear, leave them right now. All unbelief, leave them right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for freedom. Freedom over them right now. Holy Spirit, come with your power. Come with your anointing power, your freedom and fire to set them free, to deliver them from the enemy. Thank you, Jesus. Touch them right now. Holy Spirit, come with your baptism and fire over them. Holy Spirit, baptism and fire over them. Freedom and filling and fire over them in Jesus' name. Freedom and filling and fire the Holy Ghost.